it does not do harm to the mystery to know a little about it. This is a quote from physicist and philosopher Richard Feynman as he marveled about the mystery of the heavens and embraced the spark of imagination he ignited as he pondered such wonders. Anthony Alvarado has a similar philosophy. In his best-selling book, DIY Magic, he charms the reader through both whimsy and wisdom to exercise the power of magic that literally lies within. Through fun and exploratory magical spells, some of which you'd never think were magic in the traditional sense, he feels you can unlock the riches of true reality creation and discover a life that's filled with surprises all along the way. book, DIY Magic, has been described as a, quote, creativity cookbook, a guide to hacking one's consciousness. And it's written by a man who's been a forest fighter, a high school science teacher, and a telephone psychic. And that's you, Anthony Alvarado. You know, you're also the guy who calls magic the fine and subtle art of driving yourself insane. <laughs> so yeah. audience, when you pick up this book, you can bet on getting quite a cauldron of creativity and whimsy, but also intellect, wisdom, and definitely authenticity. So Anthony, let's start with you and your background. What was your life's trajectory that brought you to the point of writing something called DIY magic? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I worked a ton of different jobs, like uh, like you were describing. I've been a firefighter. Uh, I've taught high school science. I've worked as a mental health counselor. I've, you know, I've done quite a bit a bit of different things. Um, but the trajectory, I think, I came to the study of magic as uh, for for one thing. As a creative writer, I write fiction, and these are a lot of these are ideas that helped me to tap into my own creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, ideas in DIY magic about accessing your hypnagogic imagery as you're drifting off to sleep. Mm -hmm. well, we'll probably talk about that a little I would, bit. I'd love to, yes. Um, lucid dreaming and building your own tarot cards and just a, a lot of different ways for harnessing the creativity that's within each and every one of us. So it's a, a lot of uh, ideas that I was working with in order to aid my own creativity and my own uh, searching for figuring out uh, life and how life works and the, the mystery of the cosmos, really. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I came to this these ideas of, about magic as a skeptic. You know, I, I went off to college and uh, I was taught that we live in a very material world where everything can be broken down to atoms where the you know you have a table you have a glass of water you have the tree everything's very um very describable in scientific terms that's the world that we see ourselves in uh, or that that's the dominant paradigm and uh even to the point you know I was teaching high school science and uh, and yet I felt like there was something missing, as though there was this curtain. And like in The Wizard of Oz, there's that curtain that you're told not to look behind. Mm -hmm. And I felt like uh, like trying to peek behind that curtain. And so some of these uh, experiments and spells, if you, if you will, are ways of trying to look behind the curtain of reality to try to uh, get a better picture of what the nature of reality is. Um, and like I'm saying, I came to it as a skeptic. So I feel like my experiments in magic do have a a very a logic to them you know i i, I am uh, i try to balance the mystery and the intuition with reason because i think that you can balance both but it, it's tricky you know yeah. so um you know i started playing around with actually the first uh spell that i kind of stumbled upon and that opens the book DIY magic is called dropping the spoon and I came across this while reading about the artist Salvador Dali, the, the surrealist painter. Mm -hmm. And he would do this technique to, you know, he, he's got these wonderful paintings um, of, you know, the, the drooping watches on the branches and just really crazy imagery of elephants and giraffes kind of walking on stilts and really out there stuff. And he got a lot of these ideas from his hypnagogic imagery as he was drifting off to sleep at night or actually not at night he would take naps and we we all have this 
experience as we're falling asleep we'll see often a swirl of images that are fanciful and it's not quite a dream like a dream often has a storyline mm -hmm. hypnagogia you just see um different pictures kind of bubbling up it's sort of the the purr of the engine of the the unconscious mind is starting to warm up as you go into sleep and most of us just forget this because then we conk out for eight hours and and then dream and so you, it's uh, hypnagogic imagery is something that you're really only aware of while it's happening usually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, if I could just interject, uh, Anthony, <laughs> I wanted to bring up, I really get into uh, the whole idea, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, hypn hypnagogia, I guess uh -huh. it's pronounced slightly different uh, in different ways, but I've noticed that, and I've talked to other people, including myself, that tend to get into that state in what we call our twilight sleep state. And that's right. the, the time just prior to fully awakening. You're still sort of in a half sleep state, half wake state. Right. And I have found, and I believe this would be in the category of hypnagogia, <clears throat> in which you will have sort of arbitrary images, but they seem to have meaning pop mm -hmm. up, almost like a stream of consciousness that you can see going past your closed eyes. But mm -hmm. invariably, at least for me, when I, as soon as I wake up, I know that I've had some sort of information put before me, and yet, like a dream, it will just vanish. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I really, I, I'd love to talk about that a little bit. But you know what? Let's hold on that for a minute, because I want to I want to try to lead into that, because there's so many different, really, really interesting uh, things like bibliomancy and ornithomancy that mm -hmm. you talk about. But I want to get into um, this first the style in which you wrote this book okay witty and whimsical very very witty and whimsical you're a bit irreverent but incredibly <laughs> engaging and you know i noticed that this book is both light in its approach and by the way audience if you haven't seen it already it's an adorable book it's the, just a, <laughs> a great hand holder and it's a it has some fun images but, but it's pretty serious it's light in its approach but heavy in its implication and mm -hmm. after all we're talking about magic right we're talking about yeah. magic I, I do try to balance that. You know, I, I didn't want it to be a really dry academic book. I wanted it to be fun and fresh. But then, yeah, this can be pretty um, powerful stuff. Very potent forces are at work when you start to delve into the powers of your own mind and how that connects to the uh, the, the wider ramifications of of, uh, of all of that. So, yeah, I tried to balance the a little bit of levity with a little bit of profundity, hopefully. You did that well, absolutely. Thank and, you know, it dawned on me, I, I thought, uh, the, there's something about lightness of touch, Anthony, that I find in all aspects of life, things that we would otherwise consider to be very serious things mm -hmm. that we need to deal with. And, and it seems like the more we push, you know, let's say we're in a very, uh, you know, um, tumultuous situation, you know, life changing situation. Um, it would seem natural to push, push, push to get that to move yeah. in a direction yeah. that you desire. And yet, paradoxically, it seems like new, not neutrality, but a lightness of touch, obviously, an awareness in order to find an action to be able to take. But lightness of touch might be that magic or the practice that makes magic more effective. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I think that. Uh, there's this, you have to balance uh, sort of a playfulness and uh, a challengingness, you know, and I, like you were just describing with, with the book, uh, the, I think that can be, that's a very good place to write from if you are writing something and you can balance a sort of a playfulness with, uh, with making it um, a challenging, informative thing, then your reader is going to be entertained and informed. And it's, it's really easy to kind of get off, uh, to sway too far one way or the other and, mm -hmm. and either go in the direction of, of just becoming too serious and then kind of boring people or becoming just too irreverent and playful and not having anything substantial to say. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I do think that, that magic happens both with writing and with, with your own thinking, with your own inner thoughts. And uh, I think that's the sweet spot for for magic. Um you know, some of my best ideas come very easily to me when I'm taking a shower in the morning, mm -hmm. because my logical uh, brain is is still just kind of warming up. I'm, I've got I'm in that a different kind kind of twilight, the dawn of uh, of waking up from sleep, and you know your thoughts. You allow yourself to just kind of drift along early in the morning when you're taking a shower. And a lot of times that's when I'll have those eureka moments and be like, oh, this is a great idea. i got to write this down. Mm -hmm. This is something I have to try out. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, I, I actually have been thinking about exactly what you just said uh, quite a bit recently, finding that balance between playful and challenging. I think that um, a lot of these spells, uh, they, they seem, a lot of them seem pretty uh, silly and offhand at first, like building your own tarot or, or the dropping the spoon technique, but then there are some that are a bit more demanding that ask us to get out of our comfort zone. And I think that uh, if I were to define magic, I would say that we have this, we, we all have our comfort zones. And part of that is just living life in routines, living your Monday, your Tuesday, your Wednesday uh, in a routine and kind of knowing what to expect and never pushing yourself out of those routines and that becomes a sort of a blinders that we have on we can't see options outside of what we did yesterday and the day before and the day before and that becomes this deep groove uh, rut and the idea behind the DIY magic spells are to get to take those blinders off and just stand up and look around and, and think, well, what are some other routes and avenues that I can go here with my life or with my thinking, with my creativity? It's, and that can be a little bit uncomfortable. You know, I think that to get out of those ruts, it, we stay in them because they're very comfortable. We're used to them. And so it can be challenging to be playful. I, mean, I think you have to be playful in a serious way or serious in a playful way. You have to find that balance. Um, I mean, you know, doing doing a magic spell feels very can feel very childlike and playful and fun and freeing. But I think that if you take it seriously, you can also get very uh, serious and profound results. Like some of the um, some of these like uh, r changing your routine uh, type spells that that I talk about in DIY magic are w one of the uh, most simple examples. Is just there's a chapter on how to get lost. And it's really about trying to... <laughs> trying I like to that. I read that chapter. I love it. Go tell yeah. that story to the audience. So, you know, the idea is that we we often... I know I do this plenty of times. Uh, uh, you you take the same route, you know, you, if you're, you're going from different parts of your city and you just start taking the same route and pretty soon you'll find that, that you're just going to certain neighborhoods, certain areas, certain streets... And you're, there's a, a lot of uh, areas of your own city that you'll never even explore. And then when you uh, – someday you might take a wrong turn or something and be like, oh, my gosh, I've never been down this, this street or this neighborhood. I don't even – I didn't know this was here. Mm -hmm. It's a really wonderful experience. You, it makes you feel like a tourist in your own town if you can become lost. Now, get, that gets hard to do if you've lived in the same place for a really long time. What I recommend in the book actually – is to uh, ride a bicycle. It's easier to get lost. If you're used to riding in a car, it's easier to get lost on a bicycle uh -huh. um, because you, you have to take different routes and it'll be a little bit unfamiliar. It's pretty hard to get lost walking unless you're going to be able to walk for a really long ways. Unless you're in the woods somewhere, of course, yeah, and or, we've yeah, heard those but, stories. So. You get lost in about five minutes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so it, I feel like... Uh, you. In the, in, in the in the book, I talk about using a map for a, a city that you're not in. So using a map of Paris and pretending as though you're in Paris and you're trying to get to the Eiffel Tower and you just kind of arbitrarily pick a spot that you're at uh, from, from, say, your house and start navigating. And what that'll do is it'll huh. make you be taking these kind of random turns. And before you know it, you should be good and lost. And it can be a really refreshing, interesting experience to see your town as a tourist, to see your, where you are as an unfamiliar place. Um, it, you see it with a fresh set of eyes. I think that's the beauty of travel is that you're constantly getting lost. When you're traveling into a strange country or a strange city, that, that's why uh, travel is, is so uh challenging to the mind we're just constantly trying to figure out okay get our bearings where we are mm -hmm. and be able to navigate mm -hmm. um so the the getting lost uh spell is a sort of a 
a simulation of travel in a way. I think that's brilliant. And, I, and I'm listening to the sort of the philosophy, I think, Anthony, that you're trying to espouse here. What I think you're really doing, and I, I agree with this approach, is you're, you're trying to send signals to the brain <clears throat> to not expect the same thing. I, too, I, in fact, I wrote about uh, want change, break your routine in my book, Conscious Musings, uh, and even doing something as simple as changing the order of your towels as you, you know, or, or you know, the, your routine in the bathroom, even little things, moving things around in your home, all the way up to things like what you're talking about. <clears throat> but, but again, I think what we're doing, in a sense, among other things, is we are telling our brain, don't expect the same signals, because when you get that same input, you're going to get that same output. So if you shake up that input, you're really really inviting change um, mm-hmm. in a very, very unique way. So brilliant. Kudos for that. I really think that's that's fantastic. Well, you know, okay. I, I do want to get into some of the, the approaches. I'm noticing you're using the word spell a lot. And again, uh-huh. audience, I want the audience to know this is just not your typical book on magic, if there is such a thing <laughs> as a typical book. There are some things that you do make reference to that are more uh, like the cantrip, which is a little bit more on the classical side of magic. But let's talk about okay. bibliomancy. Okay. And if yeah. I'm saying that right, bibliomancy yeah. and ornithomancy. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And again, you also mentioned the cantrip. Certainly, that latter that applies to a more traditional practice uh, that is spell casting or sorcery. But we're not necessarily just talking about magic in that sense, right? Let's talk about the first two in particular, bibliomancy. What's that? So that's the uh, art of asking a question of a book. You simply you. Uh, mm-hmm have a question like, should I take a vacation in Hawaii this year? And then you would grab a book, say Moby Dick or uh, anything, you know. It, oftentimes people recommend kind of using like a big classic, uh-huh. you know, Shakespeare or something. But really, because you're going to get a more uh, toothsome answer out of a book like that than, say, I don't know, you know, uh, some some silly like comic book or something. So... Uh, get a book that has a bit of wisdom and think of the question that you have, whatever it might be, and maybe close your eyes and just start thumbing back and forth a few times, riffle the pages, and then open the the book and point to uh, any random sentence without kind of looking at it and read it out loud. And that is sort of your fortune cookie, your answer. Mm -hmm. You apply to the question that you just asked. And oftentimes, the synchronicity, the information that you get from bibliomancy is shockingly uh, relevant and really can provide some insight. Um, it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting practice. It's a lot of fun, especially mm-hmm. if you're a bit of a bookworm as I am. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is about bibliomancy and, and ornithomancy is I believe that there's a bit of a connection there. I think that um, in my in my take on it, I don't think that there's some invisible sprite or brownie, fairy, whatever, that's directing your finger to the, the right uh, sentence. I think that there's something um, a bit more... Uh, a bit, a bit more. Well, that that there's there's not some occult force necessarily at play, mm-hmm. but there is something mysterious going on. There's something mysterious about the way the human mind works, mm-hmm. the human uh, psychology of of uh, of our species is to look at any random pattern and to find. A picture there. It, it's uh, we, you see it all the time. It, if you stare at something in nature, um, you know a, a wooden door frame, and you you might see a face there. Oh, I can't believe you brought this up. You're you're reading off of my script here. We're going <laughs> to talk about that's something that's called pareidolia for, yeah, for per- audience members that may not. I want to let's let's park that for a minute because I want to spend a little bit of time on that. I'm so glad you brought that up. But go <laughs> ahead, continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but well, I had to interject. <laughs> So, so there's and and I think that there's something similar at play in mo- in a lot of divinatory practices, whether it's tea leaves or ornithomancy, reading the patterns of birds. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that there's pareidolia happening, where sort of zoning out on our conscious mind and just letting a pattern emerge um, 
allows us to tap into intuition that we already had all along. Mm -hmm. And I think that something similar is happening with bibliomancy where we're, we might get this random sentence from Shakespeare, uh, you know, from Macbeth or something, and it's, it's this kind of archaic, really li uh, a line that, that has a resonance, and we're able to, uh, uh, that resonance of, the, of, uh, of that line will illuminate something in our, within our own intuition, if that makes sense. Absolutely, um, yeah. So I think that really what is often happening in these divinatory practices, and this is my take on it, is that there's an intuition within ourselves that the kind of randomness of whether we're, we're scrying or, or uh, looking at uh, patterns in a bowl of water or tea leaves or birds on, on the wing or, or even just a random sentence from a book, it's illuminating something that we knew, but we didn't know that we knew. We we need that uh, that paradilia to to kind of draw it out of us. Absolutely. I think that's you know the process at work. Yeah, no, I agree with you, and I'm I'm listening to. You. I mean, we're we can we can take so many different what we call modalities, and they all have kind of a fundamental origin. You know, mm -hmm. synchronicity, divination. You know, are we not talking about? a holographic model even when we're right. seeing these things or the relativity of reality itself that yeah. you know uh I mean, there's a quote that I, I can only think of a part of it where the, the whole universe will conspire around your one thought and uh -huh. so you know the universe yeah. is within as well as without i mean there's just just a host of things that come to mind as we're talking about this process and i i agree i think there is something more and it, it really is a shame that i think these practices divinatory practices in particular have been sort of cowed or assigned to an outer force when yeah. I agree that it's really sort of just a mirror, a reflection of the all that's within us that conspires to give us what we need at the time. But it's right. our own consciousness that's triggering it rather than some outside influence uh, working uh, for us. Yeah, and I, I don't want people to think that by by saying that it's something within our own consciousness that I'm belittling these practices or, or trying to, I think there's still so much mystery at play there. Yeah. There's so yeah. much unknown. And I feel like it's better to kind of let that mystery resonate. We don't exactly know how the human mind works. We don't even know how uh, the, the most basic... Uh, components of of reality work I, they, I think they just uh they just redid the uh, that classic quantum mechanics uh quantum mechanics experiment on the double slit experiment where particles function as both a light and a wave mm -hmm. and seem to be affected by the observer um and they they've redone that experiment with like fancier technology and they're like yep it's really you know we just don't know how this works so there's there's so much uh, that remains fundamentally mysterious at play in in uh, our consciousness in um, in how the human mind works. So to say that uh, something like tarot cards or the I Ching or bibliomancy is a function of our own nature, I don't think that that um, really kills any of the mystery. I think that it's still very powerful. Um, uh, thing and, and with with you know mysterious uh, uh, forces at, at play, but I feel like a lot of times people want to take these ideas about magic and and either say, well, they're they're totally there's something totally weird and wild going on, and and it's just uh, it, you know there's there's some strange genie that's that's working these things or or mm -hmm. go the other route and kind of try to explain it away through like scientific terms right i'm really satisfied with either of those directions i'm satisfied with kind of letting things remain a paradox remain unanswered unknown and still playing with with uh 
with these ideas. I agree. I agree. You know, what I'm thinking is you mentioned mystery. That one of my favorite quotes is by uh, physicist and philosopher Richard Feynman, who says it d- it does no harm to the mystery to know a little bit about it. And so mm-hmm. that's what we're doing. And it is a paradox because on the one hand, you're allowing the mystery to remain somewhat of a mystery and still exploring it. You know, but you make a good point that uh, Anthony that there's so many people that seem to have a propensity for assigning mystery to something outside of themselves, not all, or a scientific explanation. The bottom line is an explanation of some sort. Right. And I, yep. I have to think about the psychology that's associated with that. And we can we could go off on a tangent there in terms of how uh, people <laughs> that do that perhaps are they want to reassign responsibility, <laughs> perhaps, you know, uh, they yeah. don't want to claim, claim the responsibility for whatever the outcome of something that, is. So it's easier to put it in a box, define yeah. it and say, I'm going with that and I'm not budging. Yeah, I think it makes us feel safe if we feel like there isn't any mystery. Um, mystery can be threatening to us because it's unknown. And I think it, it makes us feel very safe to think, well, I can point my phone at anything and I'll know exactly, you know, what it is. I can look it up on Wikipedia. I can put a flag in Google Maps. I can, you know, we, we feel like we can just kind of put everything in this little box of information. Everything's been tagged and labeled and uh, uploaded onto, onto the Internet somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that's a very non-mysterious kind of way to, to look at things. And I think it makes us feel safe to think that, well, we've, you know, somebody, some experts out there have it all figured out. And if I'm ever curious enough, you know, I can just look it up. Mm-hmm. But what I'm talking about is uh, saying maybe those experts really don't know all that much. You know, maybe there's a lot to still to be uh, there's a lot of unknown information, and there's a lot that we can we can still play around with and experience for ourselves. Um, as as long as you tell yourself that the world has all been mapped out, you're not going to be an explorer. You're not going to go right. try out new paths. But if if you once you realize that there is a lot of stuff that we still haven't figured out, then you feel free to try out these these techniques or recipes or spells or exercises, however you'd like to think of them. Um, and you feel free to uh, experiment and explore your own creativity, your own, uh, your own reality a lot more. And I, one of the central tenets of, of my philosophy is that your reality is something that you shape. You're responsible for the world that you inhabit, and you're creating that world all the time mm-hmm. by the the thoughts that you think, by the by your perception. I think that your perception changes your reality. There's no question about that. Yeah. Well, again, there there are a cornucopia, as I said earlier, a cauldron of of spells <laughs> and yeah. processes that can be played with. Lightness of touch. Let's keep all these words in mind as we, as we go through audience this conversation. But let's get back to ornithomancy. Am I saying uh, that right? Ornithomancy. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, ha- I have to uh, confess that, you know, my little my little friend on dictionary.com, you know, where uh-huh. you can look at it, because I love the dictionary, <laughs> uh-huh. look, okay. at, look up a word, but you usually get the little audio uh, uh-huh. pronunciation thing. So I had to do that before I, I checked in with you, Anthony, to make sure <laughs> I was pronouncing right. But what is that? Ornith- ornithomancy. It's, um, it's probably the oldest form of divination. Um, the ancient Babylonians used to practice it, and it's it's divination by uh, birds. The mm-hmm. Romans were really, really into ornithomancy. Um, a, a lot of ancient cultures practiced this, and it's basically, you know, the uh, the person performing the ornithomancy would go stand out on a hill somewhere, and he'd wait for some birds to fly by. And then, according to what the birds did, he would say, well, this means we should go to war or we should elect mm. somebody Caesar or we should, you know, uh, plant more uh, millet this year. I don't know. Whatever they would be trying to figure out uh, by uh, by ornithomancy. And they had a very kind of systematic way of doing it where they would, if uh, maybe a, they, if you saw... Two eagles flying from north to south, that meant one thing. And if there was 
an eagle and a crow, that meant something else. And they just had tables and tables of, of how to interpret these things. And they kind of did it as trial and error. You know, if, if the prediction turned out right, then that must mean that that sign meant that. Okay. Now, again, um, I think that uh, <laughs> rather than study like ancient Babylonian, uh, their interpretation of these things, which, you know, you could do, but a much more playful and, to my mind, interesting way to do ornithomancy is to, if, if you see some birds, I, I like to do this with crows because there happen in the northwest, there happen to be quite a few crows around. Mm -hmm. If you see some birds and you want to practice this, have a question in your mind. You're, you're trying to decide uh, it's about some situation. Should I do this? Should I apply for this job? Should I take this vacation? Should I uh, ask this person out? You have this question in your mind and then walk, kind of empty your mind and just focus on on the bird that, that you're going to try this with, you know, maybe a flock of birds. And don't don't try to project, like, if the bird does goes this way or that way or if it lands, don't try to project. Just watch what the bird does. Empty your mind and watch how the bird is flying mm -hmm. and see if that brings an answer to your head. Now, it's, it's very hard to describe any more uh, concretely than that because it's a very, it's a very um, abstract thing to try. You just have to try it and you'll, you'll, again, I think it's about tapping into an intuition that you already right. know. I was just going to say that, yeah. Yeah, you're sort of almost, I think, mesmerizing yourself for a split second, hypnotizing yourself for a split second. It's very similar to, um, there's another technique in the book uh, where I describe if you're just trying to decide between a yes-no situation, mm -hmm. flip a coin, like you're trying to decide, do I go, uh, do I, should I uh, drive uh, north or, or not, or do, do I want to take this risk? Yes is heads, no is tails. Flip a coin, catch the coin, and then be, right before you look at it, think, what do, what do you want? the coin to say do you want it to say heads or do you want it to say tails and then without ever looking at the coin just put it back in your pocket hmm. and so in that split second you've tricked yourself into deciding what you probably would have what you probably would decide if you'd spent an hour going back and forth and weighing the pros and cons it's just a way of tricking yourself into making that split decision so with the ornamancy what i'm kind of uh recommending people try is kind of tricking yourself into tapping into this intuition that you already have. Uh, maybe it's a bit like Dumbo's feather. You're you're projecting, you're uh, externalizing these the 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 search for a gut feeling, which mm -hmm. most most of us do have some kind of gut feeling about any kind of situation where we're wondering what we should do or we're looking for uh, some way to make a decision. So it's you know it's a, it's a little bit of a magic trick you put on yourself. Right, right. Brilliant. You have just such a uh, unique way. I mean, you're taking terms that are known and that have been practiced for millennia, probably, uh, but applying a slightly different, you know, tilt uh, right. to it that I find very interesting, and particularly because I'm sure our audience, at least before you described, you know, sort of the philosophy behind the ornith ornithomancy, um, were thinking, well, how will I know if, they, if a flock of birds, <laughs> you know, go in this direction? Well, what does that mean? And I think what you're, what I think you're trying to get people to do, Anthony, is to really, again, just take utilize these sort of external prompts as tools but don't put too much emphasis on their holding the key but rather them being a prompt or trigger that you have the key absolutely right? absolutely and it this can be uh i want people to to know that this can be a very powerful and profound thing this you're taking uh, these ideas and thoughts or or this intuition and you're using these kind of tricks or spells to uh, unlock the, as you say, the keys within yourself. Um, one example of uh, maybe something that might be a little more concrete for people uh, that I talk about in the book is this idea of having a memento mori, this idea of remembering your own mortality. Hmm. And that can be 
frightening for us. We don't often like to think about that, but it can also be very inspiring to remember that life is is short and you you should uh, really go for it. You know that to remember that. Uh, that you're mortal. And so the idea behind a memento mori is to have an object. I have an hourglass that I keep on my desk that <laughs> reminds me that time spent does not come back. But I recommend that everybody find something that speaks to them, whether that's a picture of something or a, a small object or maybe a bit of jewelry. It could be uh, a moth, a candle. Uh, a bridge, a uh, boat, anything that speaks to you about life's uh, temporality, about hmm. the fact that we're mortal. Wow. And whether that being kind of like a morbid goth kind of downer thing, that can be a very inspiring, powerful thing to keep in mind. And so that, you know, is about taking this idea within yourself and externalizing it so you have this simple reminder that that reminds you of uh, of the facts, you know, and so again, I think I think that that can be a very profound, very powerful thing. But again, it's it's something within yourself, and your the trick is the to uh, project that out into the world and to make it more real and more concrete. Mm-hmm. Well, that one is a, a a bit tricky for me. I'm going to chew on that one a little bit. I don't recall <laughs> reading. Maybe I uh, unconsciously purposely skipped that part of the book because I don't recall that. But I guess my question on that note, I, I, I think I know where you're going. But my question would be, you know, the, here's the debate about are we mortal? You know, obviously the vehicle is. But what about the immortality of the soul? And wh- how might that fold in? Or could that help? Or would that hinder the IT, the idea of intimations of immortality? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that sometimes... Um... You know the immortality of the soul and the knowledge of that can sometimes actually be. Um, it can make us lazy because we think, well, there there isn't any uh, immediacy. You know, I've got all the time in the world because time's eternal, and and so we can let our lives slip by without uh, without having a sense of urgency to to our own time in life as it passes by and yeah it, i think that you can be aware of of uh the the eternal nature of of the self but you can still uh th- that still means that you know like i was thinking about um uh being a child just the other day as I, I was going camping i was remembering uh my my whole I was kind of thinking back over my life, and you know it's your as as you uh, grow and evolve and as you age you're really you become a you're changing your the nature of of your uh, life changes so much from when you're seven to when you're fourteen to when you're twenty one to when you're thirty five and you're it's really each of these chapters is so different and so so precious they don't come back around. Uh, within this lifetime, mm-hmm. so I really think that that it is important to balance that sure that the knowledge of eternity, the idea of that, with the immediacy of of this life here and now. Um, I you know I, I think that it's uh, 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 horrible to to squander that and and that remembering that we uh, that we are going to be progressing through these chapters of life can can be um, inspiring to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. I think that's something to to chew on, for (laughs) sure. Well, I want to get so much area to cover here. And that's one I'm going to go back and look at that one. I think that is quite something to ponder. But I want to go back. Let's let's see if we can uh, kind of re-scrub on a couple of things. I want to get back to the pareidolia thing. As I mentioned, I had planned on bringing this up, and it seemed to fit so well uh, with the the direction of your book. And um, I don't know that you mentioned it per se in the book, but it's something that I have had in earnest for years. And Uh I didn't know the name of it until I started doing a little Google searching, a little research, and came to find out there is a name for it. This is, for our audience that don't know, this is when someone sees faces or animals or, or other symbols or familiar images and patterns of things like fabric or tile or trees or clouds 
or English muffins on eBay <laughs> that go for a million dollars, you know. Uh, but some, you know, some in psychology describe this as an actual conditioner, even a disorder. When I don't think it's that at all. What do you think is going on here when we're seeing these things, images and patterns and uh, people? Yeah, yeah, I do talk about it in the book. Okay. And let me see if I can find. Uh, could I just read a little you bit? You sure can. Please do. Okay. So actually, there's a quote by Leonardo da Vinci on paradilia that goes, uh, you should look at certain walls stained with damp or at stones of uneven color. If you have to invent some setting, you'll be able to see in these the likeness of divine landscapes. And then again, you will see their battles and strange figures and violent action, huh. expressions of faces and clothes and an infinity of things, which you will be able to reduce to their complete and proper forms. So we, what he's talking about, obviously, you know, the great painter and inventor, Da Vinci, is, he's talking about using this as an inspiration for paintings. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed with mm -hmm. this is that whenever you see an image, uh, there's there's um, a bar that I, I walk to a few blocks from my house. And on the weekend, I walk over there. And on the way back, there's some paint spattered that looks exactly like uh, the Russian... Um, uh, the founder of, of communist Russia uh, in profile. I mean, it looks just like him. And once you, once I've seen it like that one time, I'm going to see that every time. There's another paint spatter across the street from my house that I always see as it looks like a dragon. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, these these once you uh, see these uh, these images appear, they they kind of take on this this really interesting. Uh, well, I'll just read uh, one, another paragraph here uh, on it. Mm -hmm. um, As a child, I spent many content hours studying the walls and curlicues in the wood grain of my bedroom door. The arabesque patterns needed only the smallest prompting from my imagination to take on a life of their own and blossom into a fantastic bestiary of mercurial faces and creatures, dragons, imps, and gnomic animal heads, each knot of wood providing one eye. How easy it was to slip into the realm of pure imagination then. Wow. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating uh, phenomena. It is. And I think that, uh, you know, the the kind of the, the scientific explanation for it that, that you'll come across is that it's pattern recognition that we have in order to recognize um, threats, predators in nature. Like if you're in the jungle and you've got to watch out for that saber-toothed tiger or whatever that's, that might be around the corner. So our brains are constantly scanning our environments and looking for faces. Hmm. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's the um, kind of the biological hardware uh, explanation of it. Um, but I often see more than just faces. Like I was saying, I you know, uh, I think it's what we what we all did as children when we lay on our backs in the grass and looked up at the clouds and we saw fantastic, you know, pirate ships and silly cartoon dogs and all kinds of cartoony imagery. Like, and you could when you're a kid. Which I I remember spending a lot of time. Uh, with with my playmates, like pointing out, hey, do you see that? Looks like this, and you could actually somebody could describe what cloud they were seeing, and you'd be able to see it uh, as as it went by. I you know I think it'd be amazing. You know, adults should do that more often. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these kind of uh, playful techniques are about kind of accessing that powerful imagination and creativity that we all have as children, mm -hmm. and then as adults, we're told to kind of put that aside and grow up and, right. and forget about that. Yeah. But yeah, per, that, that um, paradilia is, is a great way um, to kind of tap into to some of that and start, start playing around with the power of your own, uh, your own mind that, that creates this fantastical imagery. Right. Well, you know, it's funny for me, mine, uh, I say mine as if it's something that I have, but it is, is rather a, you know, involuntary. It, uh -huh. it doesn't happen. I don't look for it. Right. I'll give you an idea. I mean, it's it's gotten to the point of, you know, uh, <laughs> constant. This has been uh -huh. for a few years now. Um, uh -huh. There was a time when this wasn't happening to me, but then it started and I started. Typically, we'll see, for instance, in our upstairs bathroom, we've got a, a sort of a... Um, 
a slate like tile in the the bathroom and as I'm facing the uh, the shower area I will see the I'm not looking for these faces. They are just there and present right. themselves to me. And they're always there. I've seen, yeah. well, I'm not going to get into it. even some familiar <laughs> faces. I, you know, they pop out to me um, in the summertime when there are leaves on the trees and I go yeah. into that same bathroom, I'll look out. We have a wooded sort of perimeter in our yard and I will look out not with the intention of finding. They come to me. So wow. I've been rather curious as to um, what, you know, maybe we can call it automatic pareidolia yeah for yeah me that's how it happens for me i don't look for it it emerges and mm -hmm. you know unsuspecting so, yeah, I, yeah i've experienced that as well uh I'll, I'll see certain uh repeating motifs like uh in cyclone fences i always see puppy dog faces mm -hmm. for example. and um yeah it, it's it's um it sounds like it's it's a more commonplace thing for you. I definitely uh, it, stuff pops out um, uh, in in wood grain and paint spatters and in, in clouds. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really interesting phenomena. It sort of reminds us that uh, the realm of kind of the dreaming imagination is kind of always there, you yeah. know, and it's it's very easy to slip into. Right. Yeah. Well, I recommend uh, for the audience trying it. I, you know, again, it was funny because I was looking up some information on it. And again, it was sort of couched by the field of psych psychiatry or psychology sure. as being a condition, as if something that we don't want, which I have a whole opinion about that. That's that yeah. to me is <laughs> nonsense. But uh, as if you, you have it like you have a disorder. Well, I'm kind of happy I have it because it's, you know, <laughs> and maybe it's certain. Do, let me ask you, Anthony, do you think that there's certain types of oh, uh, imaginative types, let's say, that would yeah. have more of a propensity or proclivity toward uh, pareidolia, you think? Absolutely. I, I, I do think that, uh, like you say, it's uh, uh, imaginative types are more likely to experience this. Mm. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a, uh, a marker of imagination. It's a marker of a powerful imagination. Mm-hmm. So if you're able to experience this very easily, I think that it marks you as a creative type person. Mm -hmm. That said, one of the reasons that I want people to try out the experiments in DIY magic is because I think that you can exercise your imagination sure. by sure. trying out stuff like seeing uh, paradilia or uh, trying out the ornithomancy and trying out these different things i think that you can make your intuition stronger you can make your creativity stronger you can make your imagination stronger they're just like uh like anything else you know practice will strengthen your access to these modes mm -hmm. well let me ask you this because there's another few things I'd like to cover. We've got about uh, 15 minutes left. Okay. Let me ask you, and I'm sure that you've tried many, maybe all of the things that you suggest in DIY magic. Okay. Is there yeah. anything that stands out for you that you have tried that blew you away in terms of the result that it had? Um, yeah. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite spells or, or techniques or, whatever you'd like to call it, that, that I kind of stumbled on. As I was finishing the book, I was taking a lot of walks and just searching for inspiration. And I kind of stumbled on this really interesting technique that I call the lifeline walk. And it, it is very, for me, it was very a very emotional and moving experience. Um, and the technique, as I said out in the book, is to do this. It, take a long walk. Um, preferably at night because then you can kind of be in your own headspace more. I mean, or in, or in a, uh, maybe in a secluded area like a, a, a park or something. Mm -hmm. but you don't want to be too distracted. So take a long walk, maybe a mile or two, a walk that's going to take like at least an hour. And on your way out, on the way out uh, from leaving your home and, and, and going out towards the walk, uh, Start with your earliest memory as you leave the as you leave the front door. Start with the earliest memory you have, and then every few blocks you're going to have to time it, kind of depending on how far you're going, how much time you have, and and time it out so like every couple blocks you you move forward in your lifetime, maybe a couple years at a time, and 
you just tell yourself the story of your life. Kind of re-remember uh, starting in chronological order and moving forward hmm. up until the present day. And if you kind of time it right, you want the present day to be about where you're turning around, okay? Mm -hmm. So then what you've done, you, you, you've taken a, a nice long amount of time, and we, we so rarely do this, and you've kind of remembered your whole story, that the whole kind of plot of what got you to here. And what I found is that when you we take the time to do this, to try out this, and something about the moving, the walking, and and it keeps you from dwelling on any one moment and it, it makes you kind of roll forward with the story, with the narrative mm -hmm. as you remember things. And uh, you'll remember uh, moments and people and memories that you might have forgotten all about because we can, we can be very selective in, we, and often, you know, we, we just don't have time to, uh, to, to try this out. So it's a very intentional practice of, of remembering your whole life story and then, this is a, a very, another very fun part, very uh, powerful part. As you walk back, continue on projecting into the future so that you're projecting your life story, what you uh, would like to see happen, what some mm -hmm. of the changes and obstacles might be, what, you, you know, what are some of the options. And maybe play around with the, the route that you take on the way back and, and kind of like think about uh, what you know, what you might see happening in this set of five years, and then in that set of five years, and then by the end of it, you've kind of experienced this little map or, or mental model of your your own life, and 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 you have kind of by kind of making it spatial, it makes it very um, makes it very tactile, like like it makes it the the. Uh, it gives you a frame of reference for the time, the temporality of it, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I love that. And I, I bet you our audience, and I'm loving it, the, the, the back end of this, because yeah. <laughs> cause everybody wants to sort of have a handle on what's coming for them in the future. And they, yeah, you know, yeah. we're really into the manifesting and creating our own reality. But again, you've put so much of a... a a brilliance. I'm trying to think of another word to use. A, a strategy. What I'm yeah. seeing happen here is what you're you're taking. You know, life as you've seen it play out, mm -hmm. threading it together with life as you'd like to see it play out, and mm -hmm. basically again saying to reality, this is a continuum. So yeah. the 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 reality that I'm imagining on that mm -hmm. route back is there's no difference between the reality that I'm imagining and the reality that I've already imagined into. <laughs> yeah. reality there's, and, there's something and interesting the, about kind of that. the the thing that you you learn as you're doing it is you'll remember lessons throughout your life like oh yeah I, I remember when i i made this mistake or i had this triumph and that was really you know that that this is really key like this uh this idea at that part of my life it'll remind you of lessons that you've already lived and then moving forward, you can kind of reapply those. So it's a great kind of way of tying together the past and the future and saying, how am I going to uh, take the lessons that I have gathered so far and, and put them forth moving forward? Mm -hmm. Wow. So many uh, different things in, in this book. And of course, I don't think any of us would expect you, the audience, to try them all, but see what resonates <laughs> for you. Yeah, you know, yeah. A couple couple more things quickly I want to mention. Um, all of them deserve the, you know, hours of discussion um, <laughs> about um, these great uh, processes. One is aleatory writing. Uh -huh. It's great for aspiring writers and, and more. Tell us briefly about that. What is aleatory writing? So aleatory writing is uh, the uh, idea of using chance in your writing. Um, and I kind of came across it while thinking about, you know, there's musicians have, have been hip to this for a long time. Like uh, uh, I think it was John Cage and there's William Basinski. There's people that have used chance to create their music. Um, I want to be clear. You're saying chance as in um, uh, chance versus purpose or you know ver chaos uh okay. stochasticity or randomness i didn't want people to think that you were saying chance like you chant om oh, <laughs> it uh, was okay like for example you could take uh if you're doing it with music you could take a a, 
a, a musical ledger, right? The the um, is that what it's called with the where the notes go, mm-hmm. and just spatter ink onto the lines, and then mm. make that into a the melody for your for your piece that you were going to play. So it'd be a very wild and weird um, way to write music, but in doing that, you it frees you from routine and it frees you from uh, it, it forces you out of the box. Right. And so aleatory, it comes to us from uh, wind instruments. If you ever, I think it, I think it was the Greeks would, um, you know, put up different, um, like, uh, it's, it's uh, oh, it's like a hanging chimes or aleatory uh, instruments. It's wind playing music. So it's, it's random. Mm-hmm. Now, aleatory writing, um, a few different writers have, have done a little bit of this, like, um, uh, William Burroughs was was one. He would write a, a novel, or as he was working on a novel, he'd cut it up with scissors and start moving the paragraphs around, wow. and then putting new sentences in. And it just starts to get like a, a very wild uh, mixing up process that forces you to uh, not just kind of write the same old, same old uh, plot, but to really kind of um, stir all the elements around mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of different ways that you could do this um, um, Philip K. Dick the sci-fi writer he wrote a book called The Man in the High Castle mm-hmm. where he would determine what the what the characters uh, would do next by casting, uh, reading a tarot spread for the characters and then that would be the the path that would happen to them and so he wrote the whole book uh, using using that process, mm. um, actually, you know, maybe I got that wrong. You might have used the I Ching. I think he was a big I Ching guy. But mm-hmm. so this idea of like, if you're working on a story, you're working on a novel. If you want something surprising to happen, try adding an element of chance. So maybe uh, the next page, rather than writing what you th- already think is going to happen, maybe you flip over a tarot card or you flip open a magazine or you snap on the television and you just take whatever random bit or you might write in a cafe and try to weave in a bit of the conversation around you. Right. And that adds this kind of unexpected, surprising twist that uh, will stimulate your creativity to, uh, to wrap it into the story. And you know, you hear so many authors, Anthony, especially uh, fiction writers, talk about how the book took on a life of its own. The book yeah. took on a life of its own. And you've got to wonder, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, you know, I, I kind of get that as a writer, <clears throat> but you often wonder, you have to wonder whether these, some of these individuals were doing just that, or some people call it automatic writing. That's a whole nother um, story we could get into. Yeah. But, you know, I think the common thread in all that we've been talking about is really getting the individual to insert creativity back into their lives, to <laughs> use something to shake it up, break routine, um, and discover that magic literally lies within. And I really think it does. And DIY Magic, A Strange and Whimsical Guide to Creativity by you, Anthony Alvarado, is fantastic. A great place to start. Well, tell us, where, where is this book available? And tell us about your website and maybe other projects that you've got coming up. Sure, yeah. Um, DIY Magic is up on Amazon. It's at Borders. And uh, if you want to support a smaller uh, place, it's also at uh, my buddy's store, Floating World Comics. He put the art together for the book, so okay. that's a good place to order it from. But, yeah, it's available from all – it's on iTunes, on Kindle, and um, you can check out what I'm up to at anthonyalvarado.net. And I just uh, I just was a guest speaker at the Western Canada Paranormal and Spiritual Convention. Um, and I'm looking nice. forward to doing a little bit more um, speaking at conferences in the future. So keep an eye out for that. Absolutely. And- well, we'll make sure to have all that linked up with the show. Uh, yeah. Sounds like you've got a lot on your plate. You're going to have a lot more, I am sure. And again, kudos on this fantastic book. Everyone, let's get the magic uh, going. Let's 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 ignite that internal magic. And I again think that DIY magic is a great place to start. So, Anthony Alvarado, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexis. It's been a pleasure. 
There is an important balance between logic and intuition, seriousness and fun, that Anthony feels we need to embrace in order to fully trigger the magical gifts that lie within us all. DIY magic gives us many ways in which to explore the paradox, both aspects of magic that are at play when we dare to investigate the mystery. I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion with Anthony, as I hope you did too. Please be sure to visit higherjourneys.com to read the complete show notes and get important links from this show. I thank you for listening to this magical episode of Conscious Inquiry. Until next time, I'm your host, Alexis Brooks.